the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Uh, welcome to WTFUS, where we are talking about what's going on in our country and today our world. And joining us are glasses only, John P. Styles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's his whole face. Wonderful. <laughs> and Tali and Ariel. I'm Rachel. This is my father, Kurt. And we're all going to talk today a bit about, um, uh, Surviving the Future, which we didn't quite cover last week, as well as a little bit starting off on um, the impending Chinese financial crash. And joining us again from Israel are Leila and Guy. Uh, yeah. They studied up on China and the end of the world so that they could fully participate in this chat. So uh, our resident to young day. optimist. <laughs> yeah, I know. Cool. He yeah, did a lot of research. He watched like people. a lot of videos. Yeah. Sweet. Awesome. So I guess somebody speak. knows what they're talking about. You introduced this Chinese uh, collapse because I guess it's been so censored. It's been even hard to find on the news. Um, would you like to just share a little bit about it to start us off? Um. Sure. So. China's GDP has seen meteor uh, meteoric growth um, in the last 10 years plus. A lot of that has been driven, most of that really has been driven by the housing market. You've got tons of people moving from rural villages into the cities, which has driven a giant um, housing boom. And you have these mega real estate companies just building huge neighborhoods of empty buildings. Um, Chinese people aren't generally allowed to invest in uh, like stocks. There's not really a stock market people can put their money in. Um, the cryptocurrency was banned a while back, so there's not that. So the main way that people have to invest is in real estate. Um, so 70% or sorry, 30, 70% uh, of um, household wealth tends to be tied up in real estate investment. So people generally are paying money toward these companies for mortgages on houses or apartments that haven't actually been built yet. Um, these companies are then taking that money and using it to start new projects without having completed the original ones, just assuming that this will be never ending growth and that eventually they'll be able to finish those projects. Uh, then basically this it's is a just Ponzi been... scheme. Exactly, because eventually the bubble would pop. Um, COVID hit, lockdowns and whatnot have been creating economic slowdown. Uh, the government last year also recognized that this was potentially an issue, so they instituted a three red line policy, basically preventing um, these companies from taking on more debt if their finances weren't in a certain semblance of order. Over half of the Chinese real estate companies were in violation of that, so all of a sudden, they couldn't take on more debt. Um, the people didn't have money to be paying their mortgages. This led to pretty much a collapse of Evergrande, which was the biggest real estate company in China. Um, currently, they're restructuring and trying to figure out how to deal with about uh, $300 billion of debt. Um, but this company was 2% of the uh, GDP of China, I believe. Um, I thought it was the GDP so this, of the world, but maybe, okay, that, maybe that doesn't make sense. But I, could be wrong. I should look. Um, maybe maybe it was GDP. I guess that makes more sense. Um, yes, yeah, so this basically has led to a lot of shit. Um, a couple months, last month in Zhengzhou, there were protests because people basically weren't able to get their money out of the bank because the banks, of course, are heavily invested in these real estate companies as well. So people... And the bank initially gave some very like hand wavy excuses of like, oh, it's system maintenance. And then longer and longer went by. People weren't able to get their money out. Uh, so this led to a lot of pissed off people. And, you know, you which led to some clashes with police. And you also have to keep in mind that any of the people who are involved in these protests are risking their right to travel and risking being socially downgraded from then on. Um, so, and then there's, there have also been a lot of people refusing to pay their mortgages. Um, 
and calling for collectively refusing to pay mortgages, which obviously the Chinese government is not in favor of. Um, I mean, and these are mortgages <laughs> totally for, for properties that people don't even have yet because they pre-bought right. them and they don't even have them. And so now they're refusing to pay mortgages because they have never been delivered their product. Is that right? Right. Because, and they're not even being built. Right. Um, they pay for years so, on houses that are either not being built at all or just like very slowly something is happening, but they can't live there. There's no yeah. house and they've been I mean, paying mortgage for years. Yeah. And at this point, construction on most of those projects has just stopped. Um, so it's not like any progress was being made toward them actually even having a house at any point. Uh, so, yeah, the Chinese government is definitely trying to control the narrative to keep fear from completely collapsing the economy. But lack of trust in the real estate sector and the fact that the real estate sector has been the main driver of Chinese economic growth up till this point and looks like it's about to collapse. And the fact that American companies are heavily invested in these real estate companies um, is worrisome. And the Chinese government has been encouraging banks to, um, to give out mortgages and encouraging lending and injecting cash and giving out uh, spending vouchers or consumption vouchers, they call them. But it's unclear if it'll be enough to actually prevent an insanely massive economic crash. John, you look like you're sitting at the kids' table. I am. Uh, <laughs> the... Um, it was interesting because in addition to this, I also discovered that um, the Japanese economy is having some serious problems because the younger people in Japan are no longer drinking right. alcohol. And, and Why? It's just, they're just not, not drinking. You know, it's not any kind of protest or anything. It's just that, you know, more and more young people have decided that, eh, you know, we're not going to do that. And, uh, and it is having a huge effect on the Japanese economy and uh, the alcohol makers and I mean, just everything over there. So I just huh. thought it was interesting how one segment of a particular economy can have such a huge effect on a country's economy. So yeah, the government is really trying to push the drinking on huh. the kids. <laughs> Oh, and so just wrong. one more thing that's... they reduced the, the drinking whole... age to seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one more thing that uh, kind of is compounding the whole economic, uh, Chinese economic crisis is that currently there are 261 uh, Chinese companies that are in danger of being delisted from the American Stock Exchange wow. with a value of $1.3 trillion dollars. Um, basically because they're not complying with American transparency regulations. And uh, the Chinese government says that for national security reasons, they have no interest in these companies complying with American transparency regulations. So that's also going to be another little kick to things. Combined, of course, with the zero COVID policy. Um, anyway, I've said enough. What's so the zero COVID American policy? Companies can, American, the, company, Americans can purchase these Chinese companies now, but if they get delisted from the stock exchange here, then what happens? Good question. I am not entirely sure. Well, why it's would, not why so would much, they want to? Well, it's not so much that personal investors are interested in these companies. It's corporate investors. Right. It's, it's BlackRock, it's yeah. Vanguard. It's our big financial engines that control all of our pension funds. That's the worry. That's the impact that it's going to hurt the United States and and, and, and us. It's not going to hurt the guys who run. Well, I mean, you guys that have pensions. Well, yeah, those those well, those of us who have investment who whose retirements are invested in these companies are at risk. If the Chinese market fails, like BlackRock or Vanguard, they're going to take and and Lehman Brothers and all the other big financial companies. They're going to take hits to their bottom line. And they're going to pass that along to us because. The people at the bottom end, you know, shit rolls downhill and it's going to affect us. Well, I'm just glad I invested all my money in weed. <laughs> <laughs> That's disposable income. <laughs> Evergrande's uh, stock is currently valued around zero. Wow. So seeing one of the largest economic engines in the world drop to nothing is um, 
We should know. buy some. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's what buy everybody some, was, we still can. <laughs> well, everybody was counting on the Chinese government to prop them up. And the Chinese government said, I don't think so. Yeah. But it, it may come back and bite them in the butt because they didn't do that, too. Well, I mean, you know, and I think the video that RL shared with us that we'll put in the link below where we learned a lot of the stuff, it's like what happened in America during the 2008 real estate crash that caused like a huge economic crash for most of the world. Um, it was like bu buying, you know, bar companies buying larger packages of other people's debt. In our case, it was it was it was also property. And so it seems like in that same way, our companies bought Chinese bad loan, like bought Chinese bad loans, just like we did here, thinking we're somehow going to get off on it, except we're, like, I don't even know. I think, yeah, banking on the fact that China, China wouldn't let these companies fall, which isn't true. Um, but I just, I don't understand how this guy who was the CEO, president of Ever, Evergreen, Ever, Evergrande. Oh, Evergrande. Evergrande, yeah. Ever, I'm just, we're thinking about weed now. I'm like, Evergreen? <laughs> <laughs> Evergrande. <laughs> Evergrand. um, how, like, he must have just, been so involved in the government that they just let this slide for way too long. Well, he was he was all kinds of shady. Um, I mean, he was. I'm sure that he had connections because you can't really get anything done without connections. Um, but I was hearing from someone in the country that he was apparently using like the ID of a Kenyan businessman or something. He was doing some shady stuff. Oh yeah, he's Chinese. The person who created this. Is Chinese but has Cyprus nationality and was using a Libyan business representative Ooh, in China to run his stuff. So there, he was definitely doing some shady, underhanded stuff. But I mean, it's kind it really just goes along with like money being God, both in the U.S. and China. Like China's communist in name only. I mean, America and China are both fundamentally capitalist systems. There's just this notion of, you know, everyone's supposed to, like, financial growth and everyone's supposed to just try to make money and make as much money as humanly possible while screwing everyone else over. Yippee! So I, 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 think, I think that's a great segue into the rest of our uh, talk today. It, it's like we are our on... lecture? Yeah, our lecture. <laughs> We are on the we are on the precipice of, of total collapse worldwide. We talked about last week, you know, end of the world as we know it, the apocalypse. It's all coming down. So what are we? Gonna and do? that's why we invited our resident young optimists. Well, <laughs> before we welcome totally young optimists. Is, actually, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, Chinese economy because it's a country. We don't understand that well in its economy. Like, we don't know what really caused, like specifically caused the, the, the current. The, yeah, people are talking about the zero case policy where uh, the Chinese people try to avoid the corona at all costs. And sometimes it, like, for them, they are okay with uh, collapsing their economy while they're doing saving people. Which is like, which is good, but maybe it will cause more harm to like close off all of the workers and can like cause this uh, crisis and might cause more harm. But I think they're gonna bounce bounce back to the uh, a country that could like could bounce back from that uh, is China, and they're probably gonna try and find a market to like exploit maybe like, shipping or I know China is really has an infrastructure for shipping all around the world and they own most of it even in developing countries so maybe they're gonna bounce back in, in a different way um other than housing i mean i think the is like, uh, inside the problem every country has it like, every country will have a housing problem and it's not that far-fetched to buy a house that isn't ready yet. In, in other places in the world I don't think it's only a Chinese problem. And I don't think a, a, a lot of other places are also that far away from also having this kind of problem. And maybe the Chinese are the first because they played with economic kind of risk. Mm -hmm. like, uh, 
for the how to yeah. Oh, okay. I can't miss the subject. Um, maybe I think if the whole collapse we are talking about is economic and we have all the stuff we are talking like, uh, used to, and uh, maybe the solution for all of this would be to make humans more self-sufficient, like uh, in small groups or in a country level groups, maybe in a uh, small communities who can supply for themselves using technology and like uh, stuff we currently have, uh, we might be able to like cut the overhead of like keeping uh, like uh, people al alive and well, and uh, instead of having a whole civilization of people or uh, like doing small products, everyone can do something small. Like in like in airships in uh, in New Mexico. Uh, I think I go the subjects uh, last time how uh, like self sufficient houses in New Mexico in the desert, uh, built out of uh, rubber and recycled material. I don't think the rubber and recycled material is what's going to save the world. It's the fact that those houses are supposed to be there, not connected to a grid or a power line or a water line, and just so like keep the people inside them alive for, for the year. Yeah, they have like uh, greenhouses, they have self-sufficient water they get all of their water from rainwater they yeah. have their whole like top is covered in uh, solar so panels and they have keeping the people inside alive and well without any relying on yeah big uh, corporations yeah. and a lot of companies are also trying to move those houses out to the ocean which is basically infinitely like enough space for everyone so basically, like large governments need to fall. Yeah. I don't know if large government needs to to fall, which sounds fun because it might be like a whole cool level <laughs> area, but I think large governments are not as needed for for people to survive, like to have everything they want. People are able to already uh, like make that I don't know, like yeah. Automate the stuff around the our life we like we are used to, and are able to be self sufficient. I don't know. So, I've I've got uh, three things in response to that. Um, one is just as far as bouncing back from the COVID thing. Um, I think that China could bounce back, but I think that the zero COVID policy is kind of preventing that because at yeah, what is this start, what is that mm, uh, basically it's they're trying to have zero covid in the country so anytime there are cases they'll lock down an area anytime um, somebody comes up with covid they'll basically lock down everybody who had contact with them uh, so there's so it's sort of this constant state of trying to open up and then locking back down and trying to open up and then locking back down. Um, like what? Which, it se which like seems what area? Like, like, like wh what are they locking down? Um, often neighborhoods. I okay. mean, they'll uh, yeah, either people or neighborhoods or like in um, Hainan recently, Hainan's like the Hawaii of China and a bunch of people got stuck there on vacation because they weren't being allowed to go back to um, their local provinces. Stuck I recently saw something. Oh, uh, <laughs> what was that? Stuck on vacation. I, I well, know that yeah, except once you've <laughs> spent all of your vacation money and you're still having to pay resort prices for everything mm -hmm. thing and you're not able to go to work things started to get a little rough i'm sure there's, um, a, there's a woman who was in shanghai so, who's american and she lives there with her boyfriend she like does tiktoks and so i've been watching the whole the whole thing Her apartment got locked down for like a hundred and something days and they couldn't leave oh, there yeah. like they have two dogs and they had they had their whole apartment was like crowd sharing groceries so like they would have this whole group for their whole apartment building. It was like, does someone have like water? Does someone have like five beans? Like, can someone please <laughs> come to my door? Yes. Like, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Shanghai got Shanghai got nightmarish. 
And like, yeah. you know, there were videos of people scream, like yelling from their balconies just to like, it was, yeah, that was scary shit. And Shanghai hard. actually, yeah, Shanghai has particularly been on a state of like constantly trying to reopen and then locking down neighborhoods. Um, I, I saw on fire and no one could get out because the whole, all the, all of the doors were gated shut. And so they couldn't actually get out in time from the fire. And it just, it was people in this burning building screaming. It was horrible. I mean, yeah. one of the things that we were looking at was like, just in the, my lifetime, the amount of people that used to live in the rural areas in China was the majority. Like the cities were busy, yeah. but still more people lived in the country. And then in the time, in the now, in the current time, that like twice as many people live in the city than in the country. So there was this huge migration from people living a more rural life where they, I guess they said they had subsistence living. So they made barely enough money to survive, but were sustainable in their communities. And then everybody would go into the city for work. But these are like mega factory jobs. And so you like give up ship to go into the city to live in these giant high rise apartment complexes for a job that then because of COVID, you can't go to and potentially because of like all these world shipping problems and everything else, as well as like at some point also going into like, how are we going to help the planet? It's like, we don't need cheap crap made in Chinese factories. Like that's not how we're going to get better is like buying and throwing away more and more plastic crap. You know, I'm not saying that everything made in Chinese companies are plastic crap, but a lot. It's definitely, oh. you even just saw a video today where we were just, it was just like some stupid toy, but some lady was opening something and every single little piece came in another bag with another like slime <laughs> pieces of like plastic, you know, and every single piece of this toy that was like 20 bags full of this stupid plastic like bubbles. And it's like, if you can't make one toy, one toy is bad enough for the plastic, but each part of the toy was in another, like you had a little hammer and had to hammer open a bunch of plastic balls to get to the plastic. Like it was entertaining. <laughs> China, China's really big on excess packaging to make things seem fancier. Like if you go to a pharmacy and there's some supplement that they want to sell for a high cost, then it won't just be in a single bottle. It'll be in six different bottles in a special case wrapped in plastic in another box it, it, <laughs> just to make it seem that much fancier you mean kind of um, like amazon but it, worse i just learned that you can eat packing peanuts did you say you can eat <laughs> you can eat packing peanuts they're i forget they're made out of like cornstarch or something not all not all <laughs> no, you, you, you have to mix them with the tide oh. pods <laughs> Add milk first. So, a little sugar. So, in so salt. To, to continue, peanuts, salt. So to, to continue my in response to Gaia, <laughs> so I, I think that China is having a hard time bouncing back from COVID because it's continuing with intermittent lockdowns. Um, you mentioned other countries also having this potential housing bubble, and I, you know, I certainly haven't been all over the world, but I've definitely never been anywhere where the where the building is being done on that massive a scale like the just the extent of empty neighborhoods in china which are just these empty high-rise ghost buildings with no one in them um is in it's mind-boggling um and and really really creepy if you ever get lost in one and your cell phone is dead is trying to find your way out of a neighborhood where there it's nothing but high rises and you can't see any landmarks and there are no humans. Super creepy. Um, yeah. Goes to the jail. The, <laughs> and, the, and then as far as the, um, you know, going towards smaller communities, I think that that is sort of precisely the opposite direction from how China has been going. Yes. As far as everyone concentrating more and more exactly, in the cities exactly and, that. and relying on the farmland for their food. So, Guy, I'm curious, do you think that people have that this trend will have to reverse and that people will have to start basically moving from the cities back to the countryside? Or do you think that this sort of sustainable housing can be accomplished still with this sort of urban city structure that we've centered around? 
It, it really depends on who you're talking about. I'm sorry to, to mm. cut you off. It really depends on who you're no, talking about. We live in an area that's pretty secluded. We don't leave the house. We don't, like, we get all our groceries. Like, we're not kind of... Uh, we're not city people and we're not attached to any city in any way for us to be able to, uh, we get it. Like we had someone here over the weekend who lives in Tel Aviv, the big city in, in Israel. And like, we were half expecting him to go, Oh my gosh, like I need to move here. Like we pay what he pays in rent with a roommate for like, a, what? I don't think it's a it's, problem. It's, for it's, rent. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think it's a problem for rent. I'm just saying that like living in a city is so much more expensive. It's such a it's such a disaster right now. And so why aren't people moving out of it anyway? Why are why are people so stuck in these cities? And why is it so important for these people for people to be living in a city? And why like I think those people are going to be the people you have to talk to to ask them why they won't move. Like we. I, I don't know if it's moving. Uh, this, this is what I think will be think help uh, solve a lot of our, uh, I don't know, solve problems, but I think it's a nicer way to do it, but a lot of other people either doesn't think like me or has uh, the own reason for going to the city. And currently people are going to the city uh, right. for work and for uh, better, uh, better lives. Uh, but if the corona showed us something, is that we actually can be all in our houses, disconnected from people, like interact uh, digitally and not like all the level three and like really uh, quarantine ourselves from uh, the environment. And if we can do it and the uh, Chinese people are doing it on a daily basis uh, until now. It's a massive scale though. It's a, it's a massive scale of change, but I think slowly people are like getting the products that could leave us uh, there because we are still living in a society post uh, or like still in mid corona people are still finding themselves like at home working from remote like, we haven't checked out like uh, working from home even though a lot of companies trying to make people go back to work from office mm -hmm. it doesn't really it's not it's not really happening that fast right and and it's I think people are going to find themselves uh, able to live away more and more from the city, more and more uh, from uh, like big communities. You mean given that the, there will still be job opportunities in those big companies that are in the yeah. cities? You, just could, from you could have everything you want uh, to have uh, from a city, outside of the city. And... Yeah, I mean, people have been, people yeah. have seen now that they can work remotely and things things like that i've like i've known a lot of people who uh who've moved to like thailand and other other random nice nicer places like <laughs> guess, places places where it's cheap piece like cheaper to live beach whatever we've actually uh We've got uh like two of our two of our uh you like like frequent guests I guess uh Jared Lord and um Brandon Ellison Brandon Ellison's living in Thailand now and Jared Lord lives in Vietnam um and like I never thought that I would leave Vegas I've always like even if I <laughs> Like, even as I got older and didn't really go out and do a lot, I just really liked having that feeling of knowing that I could do whatever I wanted to and have anything that I wanted 24 hours a day. It didn't necessarily mean that I did anything or got anything, but I just really loved that feeling. And I mean, I guess once that option went away with covid i guess i adjusted to not really needing it and well i think for me i mean i'm definitely attached to cities at least particularly in the states because of the food i mean i would not <laughs> want to live in rural america where there's just steak and eggs like i 
I need Thai and Ethiopian and Indian and Chinese and Mexican or uh, yeah. So I oh, I definitely I don't know how you that. deal with. I miss that person. so much. What's that? I miss that so much. But yeah, I mean, even I think even if I were in the city here, like Colorado is just not a very um, ethnic place. At least you got green chili. <laughs> no 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 first of all like actually like where i am it, it really just isn't around much but like even if you're in denver or something colorado they decided that they could grow their own and like they really promoted the hell out of it and have argued like that it's just as good or that it's better or something and it's not like it's not okay. But you you have In to remember my limited that experience Pueblo, Colorado makes okay chili. <laughs> but other than that, I wouldn't call I wouldn't compliment Colorado's chili. But but just remember, Colorado elected Lord uh, 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 Bovier. <laughs> so um, which she had a fun week, I guess. But um, no, green chili grows in Hatch, New Mexico, and that is all. It grows in Hatch. The I, end. It shouldn't grow. Be growing in China, which for some reason that's a big thing. China and Colorado. Like I don't know wh why you guys are growing green chili, but I mean, please is stop. China growing? What? China's, oh yeah. How, if you I get if it? you get green chili and it doesn't say Hatch on it, for some reason it's from China or now Colorado, but. Well, I will Damn, say, if I'd known they were growing green chili in China, <laughs> I might never move back. Yeah, um, on the topics that we're covering today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I'd like to, part of what Ariel said and part of what, what Guy said are, are relevant here because, because the migration into the cities in China, particularly since China is the world's largest population, um, the things that we read this morning, I think like 51% of people now live in the in the rural areas as opposed to 20 years ago it was like 90 percent of the people in just 20 years so it's flipped around quite drastically and for guy for those people to move back to leave you know you're going to a city you're you're working in a, you're living in a tiny little apartment you're working a probably a 12 hour a day job but you have money in your pocket and when they go home they're going to be tending their own crops, raising their own pigs, building their own houses. They're gonna go back to a subsistence existence. And for people around the world to do this would be basically a decentralization of power. And I like the concept. I like the concept that we would be able to make our governments irrelevant by being subsistent. Um, but that, that would take, that's gonna take a monumental amount of movement for people to decide i'm going to go i could i could roto till my backyard right now and start growing a bunch of crops that's but then i'd be fighting the local government was saying i'm not allowed to do that i'm not allowed to raise pigs i'm not allowed to raise chickens you know so you go farther out but lots of people don't live in a place where they can grow food there's and, and droughts there's like colorado colorado is not it's not an art agricultural paradise hey listen here yeah. in vegas we get four inches of rain a year so collecting grain is, is not an option for us. And, know, and, and, in, and in 20 years, maybe even 10 years, Las Vegas is going to be a dust bowl. It's going to be a prune. Because they don't have any water. Yeah. I never thought about the, the growing my own crops. Like, uh, I, really, I really hope we will get to a point where like, uh, what I said could happen. But I never thought about growing crops or collecting rainwater. Specifically, I talked about uh, like I know it, it currently happens in the New Mexico, but a uh, more modernized version of those kind of those houses, those earth ships are being made. Uh, so you don't have to grow your own crops. And when it comes to food, currently I think the food I eat doesn't really grow in Israel. And I think it, it comes from other places around the world and it somehow finds find itself uh, in my uh, plate. Even though I didn't, 
actually leave the house to to get it. And we are still living in a point where I can live outside of the city and get my groceries, get uh, my power, get water, even if it's not from rainwater, uh, and it has to like uh, cycle through. Know that too. And uh, listen to uh, right. function or something, and I'll just keep the the water like flowing. I don't know how people are gonna make it. I think it's something that like people are gonna get to and have the option to move to, and it's something that might happen. I think another one of the big things that is makes what that those uh, buildings so sustainable and so uh, friendly is that they're made out of adobe as well. They're not made out of concrete. They're not made out of whatever like crap is made in the uh, yeah. And to house nine billion people, how many? The population is really huge. One million. China. No, I mean our whole population yeah, of the yeah, world. Like, yeah, yeah. Whatever industry would have to come about. Eight billion people. Eight billion to even produce enough houses for eight billion people, even if they're made out of something sustainable, would be a huge industrial effort. Two things: hemp, well, and bamboo. You have to grow that somewhere where there's water. And and it it grows. <laughs> Back with the hemp again. Five John. to six times faster. Than, than a forest. I mean, it's sustainable. Bamboo grows like weeds. I mean, if you've ever had any bamboo in your yard, you go away for the weekend and you come back and it's like, holy crap, it's everywhere. It's but I'm medicine. saying that, that they make they can make concrete with hemp, uh, clothes, all of that. I mean, those two things right there could be a major change in the way we live and, and the sustainability of the planet. So... I, I mean, we I already have. <laughs> yeah, as we already as... have two point three or more billion houses. Like, we have enough houses for everybody. Well, that they're they're being hoarded. Right. China currently has <laughs> sixty-five we have... million. China currently has sixty-five million empty houses, which is the entire population of France. So everyone yeah, should just think, immigrate to the China. France want to move to China. <laughs> <laughs> Probably better. Uh, they both eat snails. <laughs> but I, I so, mean, going back to to you know sustainability and and people growing their own food, there are plenty of people who enjoy doing that, who love doing it, and are good at it. And those are the people that we need to elevate. Those are the people that we need to respect. Not our movie stars, not not politicians, but our teachers and, and people who have those skills that, I mean, we, we have half a dozen community gardens uh, here in Las Vegas. And there is a group of, a, a couple of them, a couple of groups actually, that are going into elementary schools and, and planting gardens and teaching the young people how to grow uh, plants and vegetables and and things like that and the the uh, all of the fruits of their labors are shared with all of the children in the school whether they participated or not so I, I I think you know if there's any hope at all it it it's it's people like Guy and and uh, Layla that are going to pull us out of this uh, because we have to want to and and most of us our age or my age we could give a shit less. And, and I use the we in the editorial sense because I do care, but you know, most people, they don't want to be bothered. You know, I know I can be healthy. All I got to do is get out and walk 15 minutes every morning. Yeah, but I don't feel like walking this morning, so I'll just sit here and be fat. Yeah, I mean, and, at what point do, does everybody like throw in the towel? You know, and it, like the, to actually do something to shift the direction our planet is going, which we talked about two weeks ago about, you know, what's causing the destruction of our planet quickly. I mean, greenhouse Fox gas news. emissions and like climate change is going to be, it already is becoming more horrible, but it's going to get worse fast. And in terms of reducing or reversing climate change is like, these are the crucial years. You're going to be alive for that, John and my dad, like, it's like what well, our efforts in the next 10 years are going to make a difference for the foreseeable future or for not having much 
of a foreseeable future for humans anyway. Absolutely. Like, but the thing is that humans don't really do anything or get their shit together until the shit hits the fan. Well, the shit hits the fan. And nobody's freaking point. out. Like, we are covered with shit that is splattering off the fan, but nobody seems to notice. Yeah. But the people that do study this, that do know, are like, oh my gosh, everyone should be reacting as though we're getting covered in shit because it's happening. But but that that the news about that is minimized. And I think part of it is like, you don't want people freaking out. But in another way, it's like, people don't often do something until they freak out. So it's like, the, the problem is yesterday, we need to do something about it yesterday. Now is already a little too late. And we need to get we need to get on it. I think one of the most important things that we can do is to actually encourage young people because they're the ones who can potentially fix any of this. And we don't do that. I don't like, think people are well, that. except the young people aren't necessarily the ones who are in Congress. Well, they and should be vote, but they're not voting. We, we might be able to change our ways, but this is like this is like saying maybe the young people way is the current like problem. But I don't think even if all of us or like a lot of uh, a lot of people will change like how they live, we're gonna solve it. I think it's like human nature for that got us where we are currently. And yeah. there's a lot of problems, like uh, global warming is the problem, but uh, economics will say the crisis in China is a problem, but uh, I don't know, like uh, politicians will say the war in Ukraine and whatever is gonna happen in Taiwan is gonna be a problem. And some people will say AI is gonna rise and take us over. I think there are like, multiple problems and we're gonna- There are multiple problems. We're gonna try and solve some of them, but. I don't think uh, there I think are it, tons I think it's of unfair. problems, but I think we need to stop voting for people who are in their 70s. And I think that we need to stop trying to discourage young people and making fun of them. Well, I think we need to encourage everybody and, and putting the burden on this. Like when I was a little younger, I was like, oh, you're going to save the world. And now that I'm a little older, it's like, oh, now someone else is going to do it. So now I somehow am off the hook. Like, I think that just pushing it forward, like, oh, we're just going to throw these barrels of nuclear waste in the ocean so that someone else will figure out what to do about it. And then they come along and they're like, oh, crap. Well, I guess we're too old to figure it out. Maybe somebody else will. And it's like, no. Everyone needs to be responsible at every single age group, and we all need to support each other. Old people have a lot of wisdom to offer, and young people don't necessarily have that insight. Young people have a lot of energy and stamina and visionary skills that old people might not be able to conceive of, especially with technology. And it's like, if we all can actually come together and listen to and value each other, everybody. I don't think, I think that's the only way this is gonna work. Like if we're just throwing the burden onto just one group or, or the blame onto just one group, it's going to be more of the same. That's You're what, right. I was, what I was saying before we started the call, we were talking about what we were going to talk about. And part of what I said was why, like, why if the middle or major being in Congress or being the president or whatever is like 35, why are we voting for people who are in their 80s? Why 70s? Yes. Why? Why is everyone so old? And also, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother show. Why is everyone so old? <laughs> <laughs> and the people that you see taking care of things now, this, this, whatever, the save the turtles, like throwing out straws, the, the clean the oceans, that, that, the, the YouTuber, Mr. Beast, he, he had someone, he, had, he did a whole thing about saving the ocean. Some guy is, uh, it is taking these huge nets and going in the ocean and like picking up like pound like mil like hundreds of pounds of of just garbage, garbage. and uh, and this guy's like what like twenty eight I I think he's not that old. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, because and, older people yeah, make no, fun of things like so that. Cool. They make fun of not using plastic straws and right. make it's and it's like that's extremely damaging. And like, I don't know. I'm a millennial. Everybody made fun of millennials, and they made fun of our participation trophies and all of that stuff, and discouraged us. You know, and I like. I wonder what my friends and I might have done or what we might be doing. If Never we trust anyone over 30. <laughs> if we hadn't gotten made fun of and put down and discouraged from 
not using plastic straws and things like that. And I think that's a really good place to start is to stop making fun of young people and stop discouraging them. And like, let's see what they can do and what they can bring with technology. How about how, how do we create the attitude of, um, okay, well, well, this is hurting us. So how can we figure out how to change that instead of, oh, you're just being an alarmist or that's fake news or now nah, you're, you're crazy. You know, you're a conspiracy theorist or whatever. Uh, we it, have it's, a culture of bullying. We applaud we applaud the most ruthless, most selfish, most reckless among us because they have financial success. And the media supports that because it keeps rich people in power. So you know, that, it, that's it always education. comes back to the theme. But, you know, it's like like the people that have the majorities need to have a louder voice. We need to stand up for each other more where it counts in our communities, in our homes, in our schools, in our local government. Like we ha- there's, there's more people that are good. There's more people that are poor. There's there's more peasants in the world than anyone else. Like we actually need to stand up for ourselves. And I think like Greta Thunberg, like there are a lot of young climate activists that are getting a lot of recognition. And it's like people like that, um, you know, it's just like the extremists of all sides just make fun of people that are doing something meaningful. And I think that we need to call those people out and say that, that that's not right. You know, we need to stop the, our, our bullying, egoic consumerism. Like that gets the A plus, that gets the gold star. We need to stop that. Right, but, like but what we, I mean, she was, she was big in the media. Everybody talked about it, but mostly just to make fun of her or talk about what sort of, like her, like her parents' parenting skills and what kind of like uh, psychological disorders she might have and like you know is she neurodivergent like those 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 people are the ones that are in power the ones that have everything to lose and and that's what that's what this whole thing is about it's it's the people who are in control want to maintain that they don't want to give up control they don't want to and, and yeah, well, if we do that, then, hey, I'm going to lose my cushy job. I'm going to lose all the money I get from the lobbyists and all that shit. So I'm not going to let that happen. Right. Well, they said all I of think- those things, but it wasn't. But once they said all of those things out loud, then everybody else was saying those things. Yeah. And like that was all I heard. I think that part of the problem when it comes to the U.S. at least is sort of the perception of our character both like both not necessarily just by other people but by ourselves i I think of like you know watching chinese movies and how you see each nationality portrayed and the american is always super brave and gutsy but arrogant and fumbling and callous and sort of rude without me basically donald trump slash george w bush (laughs) <laughs> that like you know arrogant swaggering cowboy who's going around breaking things but ultimately will be the first one to charge into battle and a lot of americans sort of perception of our character i think lines up with that like well we may not be smarter you know but we can lift heavy things feely, but we're tough uga, like, uga. we can take a punch <laughs> Like, so there's this idea that, like, you know, compassion and empathy and being considerate and well-reasoned and nuanced is somehow contrary to that American cowboy swagger that a lot of people embrace as sort of our self-image. Americans have been raised with, you heard one of the Bushes say this, American exceptionalism, which is, a if you've ever been anywhere else in the world, you know that that's bullshit. Yep. I mean... We, we we come off as rude and arrogant and know-it-all and clueless by any other country you've ever been to. They can tell who we are. And it's not a good thing. It's not. I mean, we've, been, we've experienced discrimination at the hands of Europeans because of who we are. And I don't blame them. It's because of who we are. Well, they're right. They're right. Yeah. And, and the thing is, in the United States, in this election cycle, Gen Z and millennials will have one will have thirty percent 
population wise of the electorate at 30 percent they can change everything they can get all these old men these old white guys out of office it can be done but i don't know what we can do to motivate them i mean I can't. I mean, I can only vote for Bernie Sanders until he's alive or dead. Same here. Ariel knows what to do to get motivated. And don't don't be glib. Don't see I'm going to give them all free weed or anything. <laughs> but no. I mean, that, I wish. That's I funny, wish. But I was I more thinking could motivate an millennial candidate to vote. Yeah, but get a candidate. I think have a. I think have a candidate that doesn't seem like a corrupt bullshit corporate product. Like, have a candidate that you're not just ramming down the throats of the people, because hoping that they'll vote for it because it's slightly better than the other one. You know, people were excited about Bernie Sanders. Like, young people were excited about Bernie Sanders. They'd be excited about AOC. Don't just get, like, and then when they ram, tried to ram Hillary Clinton down everyone's throats, a lot of people just had no interest in voting for her and didn't hate Trump quite enough to vote for Hillary. But she won anyway. Sure. That's yeah, but that's the but key had, right there. But had millennials she actually turned won. out and voted for her, then she would have pro had enough votes probably to become president. Agreed. Um, I, I the, didn't particularly you know, like her. I didn't want to vote for her. I don't like um, her now. I, I don't like. I still don't like her. But I don't uh, like her. But well, yeah, I'll, I think that if yeah, if if. Millennials felt like they had another option. I mean, if I guess you didn't have to choose do, between a, a giant would... douche and a shit sandwich, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people Sorry, I had to make her... another South Park reference. <laughs> the that's, that's your the, the douche is the shit sandwich <laughs> condiment. John had his <laughs> hand up. No, no, no. I was saying five minutes. Or, <laughs> or they, so a lot of people end up not voting, okay, or it? they okay. vote for a third party candidate um, just to express their dissatisfaction with the candidates that they've been given. Which is stupid. So, I used to well, do that. Or, so we, yeah, so either, so if we want young people to be involved, we would need an instant runoff system so that they can actually vote for a candidate that they want without their vote being thrown away. Or the Democratic Party needs to put up a candidate that's not just the same corporate bullshit. Right, Excellent. voting. Some states are doing ranked voting now. Yeah, Alaska which, just did it. That's, yeah, that's which, the question. Which, ranked voting, uh, instant runoff, same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. I think the other thing, going, going back to our original, one of the things I want to throw out there is that uh, Premier Xi Jinping is, is at the end of his second constitutional term. He wants to go for three. He'll, so go for, he, he'll get a third. Well, the problem is... He is starting to stoke nationalism as a way to make himself and the party look good because their economy is going to shit. And a lot of despots re resort to this. That's why the saber rattling over, you know, uh, Taiwan. That's why they're they're leaning on they're leaning on all their neighbors because they're trying to pump themselves. The, the government is trying to show, oh, we're in control, when in fact they're clearly not. And I know Ariel might have a better take on this than I do, certainly. But the Chinese people aren't buying it this time. The Chinese people are saying, we don't want to be mad at everybody. We don't want to go to war again. We don't want this for our country. But the Chinese party is not used to following the will of the people ever. <laughs> so, and that's kind of scary for the rest of the world if China starts poking their nose where it doesn't belong, which normally they're reluctant to do. So are, are you talking about the Chinese government or the Chinese people? The government. Okay, poking their nose where it didn't. Okay, all right, gotcha. I'm with you. Hello, yeah, let me talk. This is unrelated. I'll let, I'll let you talk. Go ahead. Oh, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think the Chinese government is getting, I, I, I'm not a fan of Xi's uh, policies. Um, I mean, I think that trying to bring people together under the banner of nationalism has been a thing for a long time. I think at this point, the Chinese people, for the most part, are just fucking tired um, and and frustrated. Um, and there's this, yeah, there's the phrase um, ping tong, like lying flat, which I think we might have discussed previously in oh, one yeah. guys as far as people just basically doing the bare minimum and focusing on chilling out. But 
there's, you know, there's sort of a different meaning to it that a lot of, you know, it's sort of in the lexicon these days as far as like, when there's nothing you can do, like you can't get your money, you can't get a job, you can't invest anywhere. So just fuck it, lie flat and wait for the next opportunity to come along. And I think that that's, yeah, a lot of people in China are just feeling kind of fucked right now. They've got nothing against Taiwan. Um, they're not necessarily feeling at all in control of what the government's doing, but a lot of them are just feeling in, yeah, a lot of them are feeling screwed and like they have nothing to do about it except wait and hope that things will improve. Just like us. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that we said about America, you know, like protesting all of these, all of these decisions being made by the Supreme Supreme Court. And what does it matter? Everyone's in the streets. Everyone's screaming. Everyone's yelling. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. And they're gonna do it anyway because they don't care. What does it matter to them that the people are upset? Who cares? It doesn't bother them. Like it's. It's horrible to see that every every time I see anything about America as someone who's on like Israel slash European kind of like uh, internet, <laughs> like stuff I see on Instagram and stuff I see on TikTok and stuff I see on social media in general isn't stuff that I used to see when I was like living in America. And now all I see is like Biden standing there and everyone laughing at him. Like everyone's just saying, "This is who they elected." Like this, this is the people who like are in charge. Everyone, everyone just makes like memes and is like talking about how stupid America is. <laughs> like <laughs> so sad. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, and he's doing a good job, I think, for what he's capable of and what his options are. And he's doing the best he can. I think he's a, a decent person um, with a shitty situation. And I mean, I think. You know, it's like it's it's not an easy job. Yeah, I mean, I think any president's first term, like a good percentage of it, will just be what you were handed, whether it's good or bad. And, and he, he walked into a, a shitstorm. Like the, yeah. the biggest, the biggest infrastructure bill that's been passed in a really long time, the biggest energy bill that's been passed ever, contributed to green energy. Um, he... like this, you know, and I mean, <laughs> and the, the corporate dark side of that is, you know, getting these energy subsidies to create green energy, giving them to energy companies and then having them lay off more workers and not do this. Like there's no oversight for what's happening with the money, with this, all these subsidies towards green energy. There's not necessarily, oh, if we give you this money corporation, you're going to have to spend it in this way. And we're going to check up on you to make sure that we, that you do i mean it's pretty that happened much with the covid it's all like the COVID business loans that were vastly taken advantage of by large corporations or corporate handouts where they were like here's you know big companies that didn't need that support were applying and taking 50 percent of the funds that were meant to help out small businesses and it's like if you don't have oversight it's like these grand gestures don't have the impact that they should and he's like, we're out of time. So I had I heard this funny thing that I thought was great and try this. So whenever you see economy, like in a headline or something, just replace that word with um, super rich people's golden toilets. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it really, it really works. Is it, Last is it, thoughts, everybody. I do just want to say that the, the guy I was talking about, about the cleaning the ocean, his, his name is Mark Rober. That's all. Thanks. I just I didn't know his name before I looked it up. That's his name. Thanks. You guys? Hurry up. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, like empire, empire is the fall. Maybe it's part of nature and we should stop saying how we're going to solve it for everyone and start saying how we're going to survive the, the fall. Uh, ourselves and how what what steps we should take so maybe uh, we don't get caught in the we fall. don't get caught in the fall. cool and well you've already got bomb shelters so you gotta hit you gotta step up on the <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just watched uh there's a documentary on hbo it's called the anarchists i recommend it it is about a group of americans uh that go down to Acapulco and um, it's a few uh, fugitives and then mostly just a bunch of uh, like 
rich new money Americans who don't want to pay taxes. Ooh, and, um, more rich Americans taking over other people's land. Yeah, and um, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> what happens is fascinating and uh, pretty scary. Huh. And, okay. Um, well, I think we could do a whole hour on it. I think as guys, or another hour, because we didn't really get into it this time. I think as far as guys thing of survival of the human race, I think first we need to deal with global warming, then kind of continuously, we need to deal with the combination of increasingly powerful technology, personal freedom and access to those technologies and mental illness combined, because more and more people have the ability to destroy the entire planet. And then we need to start colonizing and get off the planet before life on this. Yeah. That's and a good time to include Gaius. He's really excited about today getting the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and in, in closing, but, I would just like to say, elect the giants. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. final thought, don't be a dick. <laughs> and... Do I have to sell my Camaro? <laughs> no. I hope not. <laughs> No, muscle cars are exempted. Don't well, let the impending apocalypse get you down. <laughs> and uh, maybe after this, we'll just have a little brief clip, you know, picture of your suicide prevention hotline phone number. If you're feeling depressed, you can call someone for help. <laughs>